Good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's good to see you. Is it good to see me? Good. Come on, stand up. We're going to pray. We're committing today's service to the Lord, and we're going to go for it today. You don't get wet looking at a river. You only get wet when you jump in. So, Lord, we come before you now in the name of Jesus, and we lift up this service to you. Dear Holy Spirit, would you please walk in the room and set our hearts on fire today. Help us to worship the King in the way that He deserves it. And, Lord Jesus, would you please bring us right into the presence of the Father. So, Lord, whatever you want to do today in this service, however you want to do it, this is your time. We give you all authority. We give you all access. We lay aside every agenda. Lord, it's all yours. So come, set our hearts on fire, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you ask of my Father in my name, he will give you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has called us his friend this morning. He has called us into relationship with him today. Not as servants, but as friends. Thank you. 
are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Oh man, Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your spirit of sonship, which cries out to you, Abba Father. Oh man, we love you, Lord. Good morning, Gateway. Good morning. If you'd like to take your seats, we're going to get into the notices here in just a minute. But it's lovely to see you. Welcome. Welcome to church. Uh, first time visitors as well, if you've not been here, uh, a big welcome to you. We're really happy to have you here. It's really lovely to see you. Uh, we've been praying for you. So um, know that you're invited uh, through uh, the doors over here. We do tea and coffee after service. And uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, there's a connect corner here uh, where you can come and say hi to some friendly folks. Uh, if you need any questions answered or like any more info about Gateway, then uh, just through those doors there with tea and coffee, we'd love to, love to see you. But welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, so on Wednesday at 7.30, we have School of the Bible. Now, we've just finished an awesome series on prophecy. So this Wednesday, we're going to start a new series on Bible characters. And on Wednesday, we're going to be looking at Isaiah. And Michael and Wendy are going to be teaching us about what we can learn from the character of Isaiah. Nice one. Uh, and then further on through the work week, we have coming up to Saturday. Uh, we have our Saturday service that's starting at 6.30. So... We're really looking forward to that one. I'm not sure if you've been to that one before, but there's usually a little bit more space. We can worship, and we're just looking forward to getting to the presence of God. That's this Saturday. That's at 6.30, so a reminder. I think that's the 23rd this Saturday, isn't it? Yep, so come along. We're really looking forward to seeing what God is doing. I think sometimes, you know, we, we want more of what God's doing. Sometimes we say, don't we, Lord, we want more of you, we want more of you. Um, but then nothing, nothing changes from us. Sometimes it takes a bit of a response. Saturday night, this could be something where you just make a little bit of a change into your schedule. You think, you know what, I'm going to go to that. Actually, I haven't been yet. You know, there's a lot of us that do go. But if you haven't been, man, I would encourage you this Saturday, 6.30, come along to that one. Unfortunately, we won't be there. <laughs> Oh, well, it's, no, it's my it's my oh. mum's seventy fifth birthday, so we're not even going to be in West Brom. Oh, so we're okay. in Sheffield. But if we were here, we would be here because you came last time, didn't you? And I'm looking forward to mum's birthday, awesome. obviously. Yes, <laughs> it's it's his mother in law's birthday, so unfortunately, yes. Good to be save, there. Scott. Good save. <laughs> But yeah, because Scott came home because uh, we alternate with um, Sreya. So he was there at the last one and he came home and he was just telling me how awesome Buzzing, it was. Buzzing, absolutely yeah. buzzing. It was really, really yeah. good. Yeah. But um, for the next couple of weekends, I'll try and crawl it back. From, <laughs> from uh, next couple of weekends, there's events going on at the convention center. So when there's events, the car park is completely full, as you know. So we need to park over at the school. So the next couple of weekends, we'll be parking there. Now, if you don't have a gateway parking ticket, could you go through to Info Point afterwards and get one, please? It just helps the parking um, attendants and everybody that's serving on parking just to know who we are and that we are okay to park there. Awesome. Nice one. And um, we actually have been reliably informed. We have a really good milestone today. Uh, so get ready to cheer. It is Elizabeth Ayemi. It is a milestone birthday for you. Happy birthday. There you are. Here she is. Congratulations. Man, the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Looking forward to it's a significant birthday. I don't know if we say ages, but you know what? May the next 60 years be amazing as well. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's uh, offering time. Now, if you would like to give by cash or check and you need an envelope, can you just raise your hands, please? And the stewards would love to, to help you out there and to serve you. Um, I've been thinking this week about what we have in our hand. And the Lord's been showing me three things, really. He's been taking me to Moses. And God said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. And God used that staff to do miracles in front of Pharaoh and then to part the seas. He used the staff that was in Moses' hand. And then you go into 1 Kings chapter 17, and you see Elijah and the widow at Zarephath. Now, this lady only had a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and she was going to feed herself and a son, and that was it. And the prophet Elijah said, first, do what you're going to do, but first feed me. In other words, don't stop what you're doing, but first give to God. You know, give to the man of God. And as she did that, as she stepped out, God provided for her miraculously. It was a miracle that he did for her. She did not go hungry. Her child did not go hungry. And then God took me to 2 Kings chapter 4 with Elisha and again a widow. Now, this lady needed a financial breakthrough. You know, she was in debt. They were going to take her sons to pay off for the debt. And she needed a financial breakthrough. 
And Elisha said, well, what have you got? And she said, a little jar of oil. And he said, pour that oil and keep pouring it. And she gave to God the little that she had, and he provided for her miraculously. So as we come and we give to God what we have, whether it be a little, whether it just looked like a stick, whether it be nothing, whatever we give to him, when we give to God what's in our hands, we can expect that he is going to use that miraculously. Whether it to be to further his will, like taking the Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land, whether it be to provide for our needs, whether it be for a breakthrough, whatever it is, when we give to God what's in our hands, he will use it miraculously. So this morning, I just want to invite you, what's in your hands? What is there that you can give and say, God, use this as only you can? So if you'd like to give, and if you'd like to be part of that, can you just, you know, give into the offering today? And trust God. Trust him at his word. Trust that he is a God who says he is. Yeah, amen. Okay. Um, Stuart, you can take up the offering, and we'll just pray over the offering. Oh, actually, being as we're talking about in our hands, do you want to actually lift your, I've got mine here, shall we just lift it and just pray with what's in our hand? Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you that you are a wonderful, miracle-working God. We want to thank you that you are just amazing. There is nothing, no power that can stand against you. And we bring to you today, Lord, what is in our hands, and we release it to you. And we say, Lord, use what we have as only you can to further your kingdom. And we know that as you use things to further your kingdom, and as we release our hearts and what we have in our hands, that we will have everything that we need because you are a God who supplies all our needs according to your riches and glory. In Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, could we have the video announcements, please? Thank you. Well, good morning again, everybody. It's really good to see you. Those of you that snuck in since I said hello before. Can I just apologize for Scott? He's Australian. We just, we just let that slide. <laughs> but we love him. Actually, you know what's funny, too? Seeing some very good friends of mine, Steve and Anita and Rebecca. Steve and I had a funny conversation a few months ago. I'd heard a really uh, off, this isn't the funny part, heard an off report that he passed away suddenly. And so we went, no, it's not funny now. <laughs> This is a completely true story, no word of a lie. And so I said to Anne, we need to find out if this is true. So she said, well, how are you going to find out? I said, well, I'll call him, and if he answers, that'll be a clue. And so I call him, and he answered. And so the first word, Steve, are you dead? And it reminded me of that movie, Cool Runnings, you know, you're dead, man. Thank you, yeah. So anyways, he's not, and he's here, so it's really good to see you. Yes. So listen, this is family day. So we have the joy today of welcoming some folks in first and second service 
into membership here at Gateway, they're officially becoming part of our family here. So I want to invite those of you that are joining and becoming part of Gateway today. If you go ahead and come on up and, and stand across the front here with me. And yeah, put your hands together and welcome them. And then I'm going to invite some of the elders to come up and, and pray as well. Welcome. I love your enthusiasm. Thank you. Any elders here, come on, join me. Let's gather around these folks here. Man, it's great to see all you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the family. Hey, didn't we, baby, didn't we dedicate your baby a few days ago, a few weeks ago? Yeah, I thought so. So, listen, we've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would send you. We've been praying that he would bring you here. And we're really, really excited that, that you're here and that God's brought you into Gateway. And I don't believe it's an accident. I believe it's for a real reason, both for you and for us as a church family, your church family. And there's seed and there's soil. And God's planting you in this place because there's things that he wants to grow in your life and in this place. And we're really excited about it. And so thank you for being part of this church and, and, and rolling up your sleeves and, and getting plugged in. And, and we're excited about that. But I want to make you a promise, and it's this. It's from me. It's from the elders. There's Ian and Steve. And who we got? We got Lionel and Paulette and, and Big Mike over there. From all of us, a whole family is this. The Bible says, now abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And the culture of our church family is those three words, faith, hope, and love. You hang around Gateway for any length of time, your faith will grow, you'll be full of hope, and you'll find that your love for one another and for the Lord will increase. But the greatest of these, the most important one, the Bible says, is love. And so I want to make a promise to you from my heart to yours, and it's this. I will do all I can. We all, Angela as well, she's not in this service, but we will do all we can to walk in love towards you. And that's a commitment and a promise. You won't be talked about behind your back in an inappropriate way. If conversations come up which involve you, they'll be had in the right way. You'll be spoken about with honor and with integrity because that is incredibly important to us. That's why you're here. And that if the day ever comes that you move on, that in, continues on into the distance. We want you to feel safe here. And that the things that you share and the things that God is doing in your life are valued and treated as precious. And so I'm asking the same for you. When it comes to church unity, we're all part of either the solution or the problem. And we've been in churches that are backbitey and gossipy and clicky, and we don't want to be one of those in any way, shape, or form. And so all of us, we walk in love. Issues will come up. How we handle them is the most important thing in the world. It's impossible, the Bible says, but that offenses will come. But when we love the Lord and His Word, we don't allow that offense to take root. So everyone, reach out your hand toward these folks as they become a part of our family. The elders kind of go up and down the line and pray for them as, as we're, we're praying for them. Folks on the platform, yeah, reach out your hands. Father, we come before you now in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for this church family, what you're doing. Jesus said, you said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So Lord, for each one of these folks that are becoming part of Gateway officially, that are planting in this field within your kingdom, Lord, I pray that they would come alive. I pray that the things of the Spirit in their life, the things of the Word, Lord, this would be a whole new season of faith for them. Lord, a whole new season of hope. God, I pray that things that they've not seen and not known before, things that they've not been able to step into spiritually, they've only looked at, Lord, that they'd walk in and stand in those places. God, I ask you in Jesus' name, cause their feet to stand in the high places in the Spirit. Lord, I pray that this season in his life would be a season of fruitfulness, a season of abundance, Lord, where he would grow in his life, in his family, in his walk with you, and in his ministry, and in his fruitfulness. Lord, I pray that gifts and callings would come alive in their lives over the next few years. And Lord, I pray that Gateway would be strengthened because they're here. Lord, let our church family get stronger in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for grace and blessing and favor. Lord, I plead your blood over each one of these and declare that no weapon that forms against them, including their purpose in this church, no weapon that forms against them will prosper. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for growth and life. Lord, I'm asking you that the things that you place deep in their heart will come to the surface of their lives. Lord, the things that they've been carrying, that you spoke over them since before you formed them in the womb. Lord, that those things would come to fruition and that we would see the gifts and the callings of God in their life. And that they would bless us, bless this church, and we'd be stronger because of them. So, Father, thank you for what you're doing in this place. And, Lord, we ask you, let it only increase and intensify. And we bless each one of these and their families and their finances and their faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Listen, welcome to the family. I'm glad you're here. Welcome, my friend. God bless you. Welcome.
everybody. I'm really, really glad you're here. It's not an accident. So, praise the Lord. Isn't it nice to see when God brings new people in and we just get stronger and stronger? It's exciting. One of the things I love about Gateway is the diversity. I, I'm, I'm sure pastoring any church, any dynamic, any scenario in the world is a privilege. But I always feel like if you pastor a church and everyone in that church looks the same, it'd be kind of one-dimensional. You know what I mean? And one of the things I love about this place is how multi, multi-dimensional it is. And I love the flavor that God's bring here. So anyway, one more time, let's put our hands together. You guys can go back to your seats. Church, we come to worship. There's a message burning in my heart I want to get to in a minute. But in the meantime, we're going to worship. So stand back up if you would, please. Lord Jesus, we worship you.
don't need another. We only need you, God. Fill our hearts with your love.
our cups to you today. We lift our cups to you, God. Fill us up, Lord, and make us whole, God. God, you know us from the inside out, God. You know the hidden parts, Lord. You know every part of us, Lord.
Lord, you're all we want. Come on, just take a moment from your own heart and tell her, Lord, all I want is you. All I want is you. Lord Jesus, all I want is you. All I want is you. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know your ways and your voice. I want to know the things that matter to you. I want my life to be a reflection of who you are. It's so good to worship in his presence, doesn't it? It's the incredible thing about what Jesus has done for us. Awesome. Please take your seats if you would. Worship team, thank you so much. You led us somewhere beautiful today. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Is everyone still okay? I want to carry on talking today, this week and next, and then it's Easter, and then I'm going to start a new series. So I want to finish off talking about the Holy Spirit and, and our friendship with God. And we began looking two weeks ago about learning how to recognize and distinguish God's voice. So I remember, you know, it, it would be so helpful for us if we could know when God is speaking to us. Does anyone else beside me feel like that could be a, a really life transforming, Christianity transforming thing is to be able to recognize when God's speaking. Does anyone else think that'd be helpful? I think that'd be incredibly useful. And sometimes we look for the wrong things to determine whether God is or isn't in something or whether he's speaking. And, and I remember a number of years ago, I was preaching in Australia, and I'd, I'd just flown in that day, so I was quite tired in my defense, in defense of my defenseless actions, I was quite tired. And there was this guy, he happened to be from Ireland, and he was trying to put on a Christmas play thing, Christmas Fandango, at a good-sized church, and it wasn't going very well. And I don't know what was going wrong. I don't remember particularly the details as many years ago. And he said this, he said, but, but God must be in it because it's going so badly. And I said, to, I said out loud, I said, oh, either that or he isn't in it, you know. Because they say the devil's in the details. The devil's only in the details if the Lord isn't in the details. But don't we do that sometimes? You know, if it's going really badly, it must be God because the devil's contesting. Or if it's going really well, it must be God because it's going really well. So it's kind of like case sera, sera Christianity. Let's see what way, the, you know, what way it's going and then we'll make our determination. That's not, that doesn't sound to me like what the Bible teaches about being led by the Holy Spirit. And recognizing His direction in our lives. And so the ability or inability to hear God's voice is so important to our relationship with God and also to our effectiveness for Him. And without exaggeration, I could tell you about churches that are closed today or might as well be, couples that are divorced, kids that are prodigals, faith that is shipwrecked. In fact, there are a number of people that aren't in this church today or walking with the Lord in any church for that matter because they were convinced that they were hearing God tell them to do something that he definitely wasn't. And even though there were people around them saying, this isn't the Lord, this isn't the voice of God, they were convinced that this was God's voice. And then other people don't have any idea what God's saying unless someone's telling them. John Osteen, Joel Osteen's dad, told of a time a woman went up to him one time and said, a brother has spoken to me and said, the Lord is sending me to Africa. John Osteen replied, well, if you do go, you better take that brother with you or else you won't know when to come back. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> so it's great when a brother tells you or a sister tells you the word from the Lord. But actually, you're God's child. He wants to speak to you himself. I'd be devastated if the only way I could get a message to Levi was to send it through someone else. I'd love to think that he and I can have a relationship when we can talk to each other. And in fact, the Bible is full of stories of people who heard God's voice and followed it and in his name and for his glory did great things. It's what the Bible is about, really. People that knew God heard him telling them to do something. That's why the Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, the second half of that verse, we know it well, says, but those who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I'd like to be one of those people. I'd love for you to be one of those people. In fact, I want this church to be one of those churches where we know God's voice. So this is what we're going to do today. Let's look into the Bible and see if we can't make some, some, some significant progress in our ability to hear God's voice today. Wouldn't it be nice if by the time we walk out of here, we've, we've moved forward in this. So turn to John chapter 3. Let's have a look there, please. I want to teach it's very, very simple. My points are simple today, but I want to teach out of John chapter 3 and verse 3. If you've got a Bible, turn it. If not, let's just look up on the screen. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, Can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. I want to say water and the Spirit. Without that, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the Spirit and the flesh are not the same thing. They're not. I mean, we kind of know that, but we need to understand when it comes to recognizing God's voice that the spirit world and the natural world are not the same. There's a definite distinction. Verse 7, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now Jesus goes on to describe spiritual things. And he says this, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. So, number one, birth in the spirit mirrors birth in the natural. So your spiritual new birth mirrors your natural physical birth. And what I mean by that is this. You are born complete, but you have to grow and mature. You don't get any more kidneys, any more noses, any more toeses than you got when you were born. You started with two arms, you're going to finish with two arms. You don't grow anymore. You are born complete, but you're born immature. And your maturity determines your effectiveness and your enjoyment in life, but it doesn't make you any more born. I, I can't help but keep picking on Levi. He's the closest example I have, but he was desperate to drive. I got this shiny red Mercedes when Levi was about 11, and he was desperate to drive it. I mean, beyond desperate. And so... He can now drive. He's got his own car, wanders around. He's got no more eyes, ears, hands, feet, and toes than he had when he was 11 years old and wanted to drive my Mercedes. He just wasn't mature enough. He actually probably could have got it out the driveway because he'd done some young driver's lessons already. But by the time he got kind of out on the road and to the ring road, he'd have driven into something or someone would have driven. It would have been irresponsible of me to let him have the keys to that car, not because I was waiting for him to pop out another hand, but because he needed to mature and grow. And so now he's driving his own car, drives all over the show, but he's got nothing more than he had other than maturity. He's grown. And so don't say this. Jesus said, don't say, I can't hear from God, because Jesus says you can. Really, it's more accurate to say, I'm learning to discern. Michael, can you, can you help me find, I pre-selected three willing volunteers before the service, I'm going to ask my willing volunteers with Michael to go out into this side room for me, and they're going to demonstrate something here in just a second. So, again, don't say, I can't hear from God. Jesus says you can. And isn't this a debate that we have? Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. You're like, I don't. I mean, we don't want to say it out loud because that would seem disrespectful. But Jesus said, I, I, you know, I call you by name. So I've never heard you talk. 
And so we have that awkwardness that the Bible says we can do something that we feel like we clearly can't do. John chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says this, And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow them, for they know his voice. Everyone say they know his voice. Here's the reality. Hearing from God isn't a skill to be developed. It's a sense to be sharpened. It's not a skill to be developed. It's a sense to be sharpened. For example, you could hear three men's voices. In fact, I want to do this illustration. So in that room is Pavel, Tomic, and Rob. And so I'm going to ask each one of them in their native language to say, good morning, everybody. How are you? So if, if, if person number one could say, good morning, everybody. How are you? In my language. Okay, say it again. Dzień dobry wszystkim. Jak się macie? Okay, can person number two say, good morning, everybody. How are you? Dzień dobry wszystkim. Miło was widzieć. Person number three. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Dzień dobry wszystkim. Jak się macie? Okay, awesome. Guys, come back in. Come stand up with me here in the pulpit. So, you heard their voices. Come on in. Come up here. So, come stand this side. I'm not going to tell everyone who you are. Come on up on the platform. So, you heard three men speaking. You heard, is there anyone in here that didn't hear them? No, we all heard them speaking. Question, the f whose voice was the first voice? If you know whose was the first voice, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, some of you know whose was the first. Hang on a minute, why aren't the rest of you raising your hand? Did you not hear him? You heard him, but you don't, you don't know him. Okay, if you know whose was the second voice, Raise your hand. You recognize the sec? Stick it up high. Some of you know recognize the sec? Okay. Why aren't the rest of us raising our hands? Did we not hear him? We heard him. We just don't recognize. And a question, the third voice. Who's, if you know who the third one was? Okay. Some of us know. Some of us don't. Even though we all heard. So who was the first voice? Yeah. Who was the second voice? Third voice. Okay, guys, thank you. You can go ahead and sit down. So here's the deal. You, we all heard them speaking, but the only people that recognized what they were saying, recognized who it was, were the people that knew them. So it's not an issue of hearing. It's an issue of not knowing. The minute you get to know any of these three men, when they speak, you know, oh, that's Pavel. Oh, that's Rob. You'd recognize because you know them, and so you can distinguish their voice. It's the same with God. I am telling you, every born-again believer, you are hearing God's voice. You just don't recognize it's Him. So I get, say again, it's not a skill to be developed. It's a sense to be sharpened. Hearing isn't the problem. The problem is distinguishing who's speaking. But again, there are some people in this room, they do know who was speaking. They know what they said. And the people that knew who was speaking and knew what they said are the people that knew or know them. So we are at a significant disadvantage in that illustration. If we don't know those people, or if we only know one of them, we'd immediately know, oh, that's Pavel. That's Tomic. We'd know that immediately if we know that. Wouldn't know the other two. So Jesus says, you won't follow the voice of a stranger. But my voice, you'll know. And notice he didn't say, although the Bible does use this word at times, but he doesn't say, my sheep hear my voice. He said, my sheep know my voice. There's a big difference between hearing and knowing. We all heard them, but because we don't know them and we don't know who was speaking, we don't know what they said and who was saying it. And that's why I said two weeks ago, if you don't know God's word, you won't recognize his voice. So, point number one is this. Birth in the spirit mirrors birth in the natural. In other words, a baby is born with the ability to hear and with the ability to see, but they have to, they have to sharpen that sense to where they recognize their mother's voice, their father's voice, teacher's voice, certain sounds of a car coming, and, and they sharpen that. They sharpen their sight to be able to see that's a dog, that's a cat. They can see it, but they learn how to operate with that ability that they were born with. That's number one. Your spiritual life is the same. 
Your spiritual ability to hear is the same. Do you understand this point I'm making? Some of you looking at me like I'm funny. I'm not speaking, we're not, no, no more Polish going on. Is everyone, okay. Number one. Number two, there are two levels on which a born-again Christian can hear. You can hear in the natural, like any human being, and you can hear in the spirit. But they're not the same. Jesus said there's the natural and the spirit. The natural and the spirit are not the same. In other words, you can't use natural means to hear a spiritual voice. Which is why, in this teaching, many of you are desperately hoping that I will tell you what God's voice sounds like. You're desperate for me to tell you. It's deep and boomy, because it's, I mean, it's not going to be some nerdy little, hello. It's going to be a, if God's speaking, it's like Aslan, right? James Earl Jones-esque. It's this deep, that's what we're thinking. It's deep, it's boomy. Is it King James? Is it New Living, is God NIV? Or is he King James? How does he, how does he talk? Is, but I can't tell you what God sounds like because you don't hear him with your physical ears. You hear him with the ears of your spirit. And so many of the things that we try to do to get to know or recognize God's voice aren't actually as effective as we think they are. So we, what will we do? We'll do things like go in a quiet room. So we think if we're quiet, we'll hear God's voice or recognize God's voice better. We go for long walks. That's another thing we do. We hear the suggestion, play worshipful music. If you play worshipful music, you'll be able to hear God's voice better. Here's another one we like to do. Close your eyes. Everyone closes the eyes when they pray. We teach children in school, close your eyes and fold your hands to pray. Why? Thinking that with our eyes closed and our hands folded, we will hear God better. Perhaps if he spoke in the natural, in a quiet room would be really handy or with soft music in the background, or with the curtains closed. Kneeling down, that's another thing. You've got to kneel down to hear God's voice. Is anyone beside me, once you begin to learn to recognize God's voice, found that God talks more when you're in the shower or when you're driving down the road than he does when you're... Why? Because he's not, he's not worried about the volume. He's not worried about the lights being on or the lights being off. So when people leave worship, I say, leave worship with your eyes open. You don't get in the spirit with your eyes closed any quicker than with your eyes open. Now, I will say this. Sometimes being undistracted helps us. But actually, you can learn to recognize God's voice. in the. You can be in the middle of London and recognize God's voice. It can, you can be in a crowded airplane and hear God speak. Because he's not speaking to your physical ears. And so the things that we use to try and naturally hear... Don't work in the spirit. None of these things, the long walks and the worshipful music, and the, none of these things hurt, but it's still not the means by which you hear God's voice. And that's why I can't tell you he sounds like this, because I don't hear God's voice. I know his voice. It's something you just come to know, which is the same word used throughout the Bible to describe intimacy. Adam knew his wife Eve. We all know what he's talking about, right? There's children in the room, so we'll leave it there. But it's describing intimacy. It's not just a voice you hear. You know God. It's something that you just come to know. And the Bible teaches that, again, the water, the spirit, they're not the same. There are two levels on which a Christian hears and sees. We hear in the natural. We see in the natural, the body and the soul. But we also see in the spirit. And you can hear in both, but your senses aren't necessarily sharpened. The Bible talks about this in Hebrews chapter 4. I love this verse. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 says this. But solid food belongs to those who are of a full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised or trained to discern both good and evil. Your senses, by reason of use, the more you use this, the more you sharpen this sense, the more you will begin to discern, you exercise yourself to discern good and evil. And here's the reality. The world cannot hear the Spirit of God. In fact, the Bible says it's foolishness to them because it's spiritually discerned. The voice of God is spiritually discerned. They can, however, hear evil spirits or familiar spirits. And this is why you have to be very, very careful not to go to a non-Christian to try to get divine direction because they cannot hear from the Spirit of God. Never do that. So what am I talking about? Tarot cards, horoscopes, star signs, tea leaves, other religions, 
holy men, fortune tellers, Ouija boards, people who claim to speak with deceased relatives, none of them are hearing from the Spirit of God. And any voice that they are hearing and conveying to you is a familiar spirit. And I'm telling you, it will lead you into a trap faster than you can imagine. Stay away from it. Have nothing to do with it. The voice of the Spirit is only discernible to those who are born again. It is foolishness to the world and they cannot hear it. And if you've been involved in some of these things, you need to come back to the blood and say, Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, and wash me. You don't want anything to do with that in your life. Don't even do it for fun. You're at the fun park and there's a crystal ball teller. Don't go there. Trust me. Don't go near it. And number three, the Bible teaches us in this passage that we read that the voice of the Lord is like the wind. So how does that help? The wind moves you in a direction more than it's a static instruction. We are waiting to hear commands and directions from the Lord. But when you come to know and recognize the voice of the Lord, it's more like the wind moving you in a direction. In other words, the Holy Spirit leads. So all day he will be leading you somewhere. This is how it begins to work. Because don't you think that God knows that later in the day you'll be meeting with someone that, I don't know, needs some money. Don't think he knows that at 7 o'clock this evening, you're going to come across the path of someone that he wants to use you to bless. So what does he do? He begins to prepare you first thing in the morning. The wind starts blowing in that direction. You'll find that as you're reading something in the Bible, this is why daily Bible reading is so important, something will begin to move your heart. You'll sense a, a shift, the, the sail or the flag of your life, instead of blowing this way, is starting to blow that way. Then driving to work, you listen to a song on UCB, and it starts talking about the spirit of generosity or God using you to bless someone. Later in the day, the Holy Spirit brings a verse to your memory. In fact, as you're going about minding your own business, He brings things to your remembrance, the Bible says. Or maybe a story that you've heard recently in a sermon about generosity or, or Wendy was talking the other day about paying for people's food. And that, that story just keeps coming to your mind. You'll find a verse that keeps coming back to you. And, 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 and the Bible talking about there is the scatters and yet increases. And there is that withholds more than is meat, but it tends to poverty. The liberal soul shall have abundance. He that waters others will be watered also himself. And you don't know to quote that verse, but it, it's like it's coming up in your spirit. And you find you have more of a recollection of a verse than you have memorized. And you think, where did that come from? You're beginning to know the voice of God. All of a sudden, you find yourself standing next to someone in church next Saturday night, and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you. You know his voice saying, I've led you to that person for a reason. They're going through a trouble that they haven't told anybody about, and you're the one I want to use to fix them, and your heart is drawn to them, and you go up and you say, I, I just feel the Lord is telling me. I feel God is saying to me to give you this 100 pounds. And they burst into tears and they say, how did you know I was praying on the way here that God would meet my need in this service? How did you know? And then they want to know, what did God's voice sound like when he told you that? Was it like James Earl Jones? Was it Liam Neeson? What did you sound like? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't hear, I know. I knew he was telling me. I knew he, how do we know what song to lead? You know he's, he's leading this way. He's drawing you in that direction. How do I know what to preach on? I look for the wind. Where's he blowing? Where's he stirring in my life? What's he been saying to me? The Holy Spirit leads me. He leads you. I say, wow, did you hear an audible voice? No, I just, I just, I know. I know his voice. We heard, we all heard these three guys talking in the other room, but only the people that knew them could distinguish what they were saying and who was saying it. We all know or hear God's voice. He's leading every one of us, but we, haven't, we don't know him well enough to tune it. The Holy Spirit, like the Lord, leads you to a place. He leads you to where he wants to use you. He leads you into revelation. He leads you into truth. He doesn't bark orders. I rarely find the Holy Spirit barking orders at me. Jesus is a shepherd, not a cowboy. He leads. He doesn't drive. And can I be honest with you? If the first time healing has crossed your mind in six weeks is when you see someone in a wheelchair in Tesco's, 
and you hear a voice saying, go pull them out of that wheelchair, and panic fills your heart and your head because you're not prepared for that. You aren't ready for that. It's very unlikely it's God's voice leading you. If the first time it's crossed your mind in months is when you feel him leading you to do something huge, it's probably not him. And then, it's, in fact, it's more likely the devil driving you. Because then, when you don't do it, you feel guilty and you feel the sense of condemnation. Or you step out and you realize, actually, it wasn't the Lord. Because he's not standing there beside me telling me to do it. And you feel like a failure as a Christian. I've got no faith. And the devil will drive you. The Holy Spirit will lead you. And if you don't feel like you're being led in this direction, it's not the Lord. Because the Bible says he leads you into paths of righteousness. And in fact, the paths of righteousness, which speaks of fruitfulness, are found beside still waters and in green pastures. This is where Jesus leads you. Satan drives you to choppy, stressful waters. Fields where you've had nothing growing before. And the places where you feel like an unrighteous failure. That's the driving voice that's not of the Lord. So if it's not a place of stillness, where you know the word in that area. You've been spending time meditating on it. There's green pastures. There's stuff growing in your life in that area. That's where the Lord will lead you, and you'll find your step in a path of righteousness there. So when I've been meditating on things a lot in the word, I hear the Lord's voice or perceive the Lord's voice a lot with words of knowledge and pray for this person. There's healing over there, and it's just like a healing river flows. But it doesn't start when I lay hands on someone. It started a couple of weeks before. When the, when the wind began to blow and the Holy Spirit started turning my ship and moving me in that direction. And all of a sudden, I find the things that he has been preparing me for, he now uses me in. If you're hearing almost a, a, a and I hope this term isn't offensive, like a schizophrenic type leading of the Holy Spirit. Heal that person. And you just give away your car. Don't drive down that road. Stop. Don't drive the road. Quick, pull your children out of school. Homeschool them. Go to Africa. No, 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 no. No, go to China. Marry him. No, marry her. And you, I mean, you're all over the show. That's not the Lord. Because he leads you. He doesn't drive you. He doesn't bark orders at you. He comes and walks with you and talks with you. When I'm built up in an area in the Word, I hear a lot of things in that area. When I'm built up around finances, I find myself being generous left, right, and center. Why? Because I, I hear the voice of the Lord leading me and recognizing to bless this person, help that person. Otherwise, I'm just giving because I'm giving. I'm, I'm trying to work my way into something that he wants to lead me into. And there's no fruit in it. The Bible says, by reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. And here's the reality. If you're not using it, you're losing it. If you're not using that area, if you're not meditating on that area of the word, you will be you are going backwards. And you have to build yourself back up. So you went on a mission trip a few years ago. You prepared for it. You got ready for it. God was using you left, right, and center. But you haven't cracked open those verses since. It's incredibly unlikely that the Holy Spirit will use you. He will use someone that has been listening to him and is already pointing in that direction that is full of the word, that is full of the Holy Spirit, that knows his voice in that area. God's got hundreds of people just in this room he can use. So if I'm not available, then he'll use someone else. And that's fine. But he'll use someone that is ready. You understand what I'm talking about today? Is this helping? Okay, thank you. So, how do I get to know? How do I get to know God in this way? I, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I kind of want to pick up on this a little bit. Find a passage of Scripture. Here's, here's my advice. I talked about this last time. If you don't know the Word of God, you won't know the voice of God. This book right here is the key. Again, it's not what he sounds like. It's not the quiet room, the eyes closed, the hands folded. That's not how you hear in the Spirit. Reading this is how you hear in the Spirit because you, you learn to know and to perceive and to recognize. So if you never read this, you won't be hearing God's voice. Again, that's another way you can tell whether someone is being led or driven. If they're being led by the Lord, that person is a word person, a Bible person. If you're not a Bible reader, the voices you're hearing are not the Lord. Sorry but it's true. Sorry, not sorry. So, ask the Lord questions about the thing that you're reading in the Bible. I'm telling you, man, if we could get this, we could change the world. So, please listen to what I'm saying. 
ask questions about the thing you're reading in the Bible. So let's pick a psalm that we all know really well. Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You read through that. Read through it thoughtfully. Read through it intentionally. And then with your pen and your paper, you say, Lord, would you begin to speak to me about that? Don't read about Psalm 23 and then ask what's wrong with your house or your spouse or silly questions like, did Adam have a belly button? Start asking about the thing that you read that morning and write down what you feel or perceive that God is saying to you. Doesn't matter if it seems like, well, that's not prophetic. That wasn't King James. He didn't have a booming voice. Just start writing down the things that you feel, that you perceive, that you're, you kind of all of a sudden just know about that passage you just read. Have available in a phone or a notepad to jot down the direction of the wind. In, oh, this is point number two. So write down what you hear him say. Number two, yeah, you want to have something on you. I use voice notes on my phone. Most of my sermons I write as I'm out walking, and I speak them into voice notes, and then on Thursday I compile them. Changed it a little bit lately, but that's generally what I do. But I use voice notes all the time. So I was in a service yesterday, very, very long service. Started at 9. I'm, I'm, can I just say I'm eliciting sympathy? It started at 9. It finished at 6 in the evening. There was one 30-minute break. Yeah. And the night before, it started at 6 and ended at 10.30. So, anyway. And the, the guy leading the service said, I, I mean, I led three of them, but he led the other four. He said, in revival, you only know when the service starts. And I thought, actually, that's true. You know, you, in revival, you announce the start time. You don't announce the end time. But, but still, my backside had given up the ghost by about 2 o'clock yesterday. I was crying for the rapture. But mercifully, the Lord began to speak something to my heart. And so I had a holy excuse to leave the service and go out. And I pulled out my voice notes. It's on here. I won't play it to you because I was being quiet. So it sounds really creepy when I play it back. You know, the Lord said this. And you're like this, <laughs> like waiting to pick your child up from school. And you got this like serial killer voice. So just play it to yourself and then leave it alone. But I speak into there what I feel the Lord saying. And I begin to recognize the direction of the wind in my life. God is bringing me into something. Then I know I need to be aware of that. If he's moving me in an area of healing, I just need to have a compassion for certain something. Chances are very, very soon I'll be minding my own business and I will just know that I'm supposed to do something or minister to someone or make a decision or pray for something or sell something. I'll just know because he's already been leading me in that direction. So have a place, your phone, a notebook, a, however is your way to jot down the direction of the wind in your life. Recognize where he's leading you. And here's the thing, my friend. Once you get the hang of this, it's absolutely life-changing. And we will save ourselves so many mistakes because we're recognizing, mm, he's not been leading me there. It's a great idea. That investment looks fantastic. But I haven't heard anything lately from the Lord about investing. You can make a fortune in cryptocurrency. You're going to lose a fortune in, in the same day. I haven't had the Lord lead me anyway that direction or this direction or we should plant another church. That's the first time that thought's crossed my mind. It's not the Lord because he's not been leading me there. But when you know it's time, it's because he's already been working in your life. And this doesn't mean you'll hear God's voice every 30 seconds. Maturity doesn't need that. Maturity knows the direction of the wind and moves that way anyway. When your child is two, they need your voice every two minutes. I mean, all the time. They need the correction, the direction, and the encouragement and other things. But they need the parents speaking to them every, what, two, I mean, it's been a long time since I have a two-year-old, but a lot. But once your child hits 20, if you're telling them every two minutes, stand up, sit down, brush your teeth, tie your shoelaces, park the car, tidy your room, do your homework. At some point, you think, hang on a minute, you need to take a step back, Jack, and let this person mature. They know the direction. They know what they're supposed to be doing. You won't be hearing every 30 seconds because you'll know the direction of the wind. And unless you're getting it wrong, you won't get a check in your spirit. You just follow where he's been leading you. And you learn to know his voice. Okay, let's pray. I want to stop there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our new birth. Thank you that we've been born of the Spirit. And we have eyes and ears to hear into the spirit realm. And Lord, I thank you that what you said is true. We do hear your voice. 
We are your sheep. We do hear your voice. Lord, please help us to recognize and to sharpen our senses to recognize when it's you talking. Lord, I pray for everyone in here, myself included, that our desire to know you would increase. Lord, that we would then know when it's you talking and when it's someone else. So Lord, please help us to develop the ability to know and recognize your voice. Lord, I know it will change our lives, but even more than that, we will be so much more effective in everything you're asking us to do with our lives once we know your voice. So, Lord, I ask you for your help in this. Dear Holy Spirit, please engage with this message and change our lives with it this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord thanks for his word. And don't you love the leading of the Holy Spirit? So simple, but so powerful. I'm going to ask the altar team to go ahead and come. If you need prayer in any area of your life, there'll be people standing here ready to pray with you and spend a few minutes with you. Don't walk out of here with unmet needs. If you got kids, please grab them. And then come back, let's spend some time together. If you're sitting beside someone that just became a member of the family today, give them a big hug and tell them welcome to the family. But church, I love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week. Oh, oh, can I say this as you get up and going? I have a really, really powerful word for Saturday night. It is something burning in me about territorial authority and about changing the atmospheres and the, and the authority that we have in this region. It's really powerful. I need you there to help me get it out. So see you on Saturday night. I love you. God bless you, everybody. Thank you.